Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And God, I pray that you would be in our midst. Lord, that you would bless the word as it goes forth. Welcome to Staying the Course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. All right, good morning. If you have your Bibles, we made it to Philippians chapter 2. And today we are going to talk about a theological term called the kenosis. How many of you have ever heard of the kenosis? Okay, a few of you, if you've studied uh, theology. Last week we talked about unity in the church. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, uh, it really is a capstone to the message from last week. And it says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interests of others. And really that sums up what we talked about last week. It's really being loving Christians. It's preferring others above oneself. But what Paul is actually talking about is what Jesus really did for us. And we're going to read about that in verses 5 through 11. So it's real love is to deny yourself, deny your flesh, and to serve others. In fact, if we would all do that, what I have found, the more I pour into other people, the more God pours into me. Have you found that to be true? You know, if I am ever dealing with depression, anxiety, worry, any of those negative fruits of this world, if I begin to serve somebody, all of a sudden I am filled with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden I am blessed more than the person I serve. And by the way, a lot of Christians don't know how to receive from other believers. If you have a need, believe me, don't rob the other believer for helping you. You know, a lot of Christians say, oh, no, no, I don't need your help. But what you're doing is robbing them of a blessing. So we covered all that last week. Today, we literally is one of the most significant Bible passages in Scripture. It's about when Christ, who created the world, literally emptied himself. Again, that's called the kenosis. And we're going to study that today. God wrote himself into the human story. It's amazing what Jesus did. Can't wait to get into the text. So our text today is super important. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. And we'll read 5 through 11 as we go through it today. It says, literally, that Christ came and emptied himself for us. In verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. I want you to know this first and foremost. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are equal. They are three persons that make up the one Godhead, but there is hierarchy. We know that the Father is the head of all. Christ, the Bible says in Corinthians, is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. And so we have a hierarchy established by God. Continue on, verse 7. But he emptied himself. And the word emptied there is the Greek word kenosis. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. For 
hold on. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, some of the font is hard to read in the sun, but I can do it. I know Susie's going to try to get me an umbrella, but don't do it, Susie. She's probably already doing it. <laughs> For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, throughout the New Testament, the Trinity is not a mystery. You know, Paul writes, you know, that Jesus came to glorify the Father. And now we find out in Revelation that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven on his own throne. In fact, Jesus walked up to the Father and received the scroll which he breaks the seven seals. This is called the Incarnation. Uh, the kenosis, the emptying, and the incarnation is when the eternal Son of God permanently took upon himself human form. I want you to consider that Jesus, we're told in the Gospel of John, created all things. All things were created through him and for him. And the Creator became a man for all eternity. He's going to have his scars in heaven. Of course, he's now glorified, but when we see him, what does the Bible say? We will be like him. Man, we're going to get glorified bodies too. The creator of the universe wrote himself into the human story, and one of the main reasons was so that he could show us how to live. Jesus became flesh. Jesus emptied himself of many of his divine attributes. Though still fully God, he no longer had all the attributes. And we're going to read the verses that establish that. If you have your Bibles, flip over to 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. You don't have to turn there because we're going to go fast, but you can if you want to really practice finding all these verses that we go through. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So I want you to know that Jesus literally became a human being. He was born, he's the first begotten and only begotten Son of God, even though he existed eternally with the Father from eternity past, he was begotten through Mary, thus he is the only begotten Son of God. You and I were not begotten of God, he created us. So there's only one begotten of God, that's Jesus Christ, even though he eternally existed for eternity past. Are you with me? Okay, so he was begotten. We are not begotten. You know, the Mormons say we're all begotten of God, but the Bible is clear there's one begotten child of God. That's Jesus Christ. You and I are children of God, heirs, joint heirs with Jesus, but again, we're created, not begotten. Totally different. It's also called the hypostatic union for all of you that have studied theology. The hypostatic union is the union of two natures in one body, fully God and fully man, Jesus Christ. It's important to get that. Some of the heresies back early in the church time, people would say he was a, a ghost or a spirit and literally was not in the flesh. And that's why John wrote in 1 John and 2 John, if you deny that Christ was a fleshly human, you deny everything, you are lost. So he had to have that union, 100% God and 100% man. So we have the kenosis, the emptying of Christ, and I want to define that for you. But before we get there, can God be tempted? Do you think God can be tempted? Well, the Bible tells us clearly in James chapter 1, verse 13, 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Note this, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So I want you to consider this. When Christ emptied himself, was Jesus tempted? He was. So the Bible says God cannot be tempted. So what did Jesus empty himself of to the point that he could be tempted by sin? Because we read in Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. I love that. You know, Jesus knows exactly what you're dealing with. He knows the temptations that you feel on this earth. But it says, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. I want you to consider that God cannot be tempted. That's clear in Scripture. He can't be tempted, and he doesn't tempt anyone. Yet Jesus Christ was tempted. So when he emptied himself, what did he empty himself of? He was equal with the Father. We read that. But he became a man and was tempted by every evil you can imagine. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that they might receive the adoption as sons. Remember, Christ is the only begotten Son. We are adopted sons and daughters. Emmanuel, who knows what that means in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. God with us. And it says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and she shall bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So we need to fully understand who Jesus Christ is and now and who he was when he emptied himself. He's God with us, yet God cannot be tempted, yet Christ was tempted. So he emptied himself of part of who he was as equal with God the Father. We're going to get into the verses soon. The kenosis. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, back to our text. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God, speaking of the Father, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. All right. So the kenosis in the Greek literally is uh, uh, to empty, to make void, to totally give something up. So what did Jesus give up? Many theologians say, oh, he didn't give up his divinity. And in fact, many theologians say he didn't give up any of the divine attributes. He was still omnipresent. He was still omnipotent. He was still uh, omniscient. He knew everything. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Again, God cannot be tempted, yet Christ was tempted. Very interesting. The word is used five times in the New Testament, and in all those places it means completely void, empty, worthless, of no effect. Jesus created all things, and yet he became a little baby developing in Mary's womb, was born just like you and I had to learn to walk, had to learn to talk, had to learn to think, had to learn how to read, had to learn everything that we learn, and he was tempted in all things exactly like we are yet without sin. In order to be fully human, I would submit to you that Jesus had to give up some of his divine attributes. One of those is omnipotence. One of those is omnipresence. And the other one is omniscience, all-knowing. So all-powerful, present everywhere through the agency of the Holy Spirit, and all-knowing 
Those are the ones that Jesus gave up. And I'm going to give you the scriptures here in a minute. Otherwise, he could not have shared in our human experience. He would not know what it's like to be a human if he wasn't fully human. He had to be limited by space and time to be tempted, and even knowledge, which he had to learn how to read. He had to learn everything, even as we do. He, to be human, to be tempted, and to be uh, our sacrificial, um, really, lamb on the cross, he had to be fully human in every way. He gave up everything for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, that was in his pre-existence with God the Father for eternity, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you would become rich. He gave up his place, and he gave up many of his attributes to come here. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, you can turn there if you would like, it says, therefore, since the children, speaking of us, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power over death, that is, the devil. And he might set free those through fear of death were subject to the slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. That means he was completely human in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he was also able to aid those who are tempted. I love that. We already read it. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Folks, he knows whatever you're tempted with the most in life, he knows exactly what that feels like. Yet for him, he never fell to the temptation. He indeed was sinless, the spotless Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In the beginning was the Logos, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, speaking of Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made, and in him was life, and that life was the light of men. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Skipping down to verse 10. Verse 11, he came to his own, the Jews, and those who were his own did not receive him. Skipping down to verse 14, and the word, the logos, became flesh, fully human, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. A lot of theologians say the only thing Jesus gave up or emptied himself of was the glory of God because uh, they theorize no one could see the glory of God and live, and yet here we're told they saw his glory. That's not what he emptied himself of. He was still worshipped as a man because why? He was fully God. He had just emptied himself of a few attributes. Interesting. Interesting. Fully God, fully men. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Some theologians take this verse and say, Aha, see, he didn't empty himself of his power, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, or his omniscience, all-knowing ability. Because it says the fullness of the deity dwelt in him in bodily form. Those theologians neglect to look at the Greek and what that word actually means. The word is theotetes, theotetos. How do you say it, Cody? <laughs> and it literally means the Godhead or the personality of who he is. Jesus never lost his personality or the, being a third member of the Godhead. 
But I want you to know this. There's another word that could have been used there, and that word is theotes, and it's in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And that, that word there is the divine power, the omniscience, the omnipresence, and all of that. Two different Greek words. So when Christ dwelt his personality as the second member of the triune Godhead, but it doesn't say what hit the divine power was in there. Are you with me? Kind of? Sort of? No? <laughs> I lost you? So when the fullness of deity dwelt in Christ, it was the fullness of the personality of who he was as the second member of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not the word deity here, which means the divine powers, speaking of the omnipresence, omnipotence, and all of that. So that's what he didn't have because he emptied himself. Even the resurrected Lord was flesh and blood. Did you know that? In fact, we're going to see and be like him. Luke chapter 24, verse 39, he said, look at my hands, look at my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And that's the resurrected Lord. Hebrews 2.14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. So Jesus literally became a human. He understands exactly every pain, every trial that you face. So what did Jesus empty himself of, and what does the Bible say? One thing, he's always been subordinate to God the Father from eternity past. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So Jesus said there quite clearly, I am doing my Father's will in heaven. Not my will. Remember, he prayed in the garden. What did he pray? In Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, Jesus said, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. What was Jesus' will? To not die on the cross. He said, Lord, remove, Father, remove this cup from me. I don't want to take upon their sin. But not my will, let thine be done. Why? Because Jesus was fully human. He was tempted as we are yet without sin, and he accomplished God's will, not his own will. Jesus didn't speak his own words. In fact, he says in John 12, 49, For I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me, he has given me command as to what to say and what to speak. So even the words of Christ that we read are not Christ's words, but God the Father speaking through Christ to us. I mean, clearly that's what the Bible says. In John 12, 50, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So when Jesus would get alone and pray, which he did often, he was communing with the Father, and the Father was telling Christ what to say. Interesting. If Christ was still omniscient or all-knowing, he would not need the Father to tell him because they would be so unified, he would already know. Are you with me? Okay. Jesus was dependent on God and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, even as you and I are. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, man is the head of woman, and God the Father is the head of Christ. In John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, woman, after he was raised from the dead. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. This is Jesus talking. Jesus was not omniscient. In fact, he said in Mark 13, 32, speaking of the rapture, but of the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, nor me, 
but the Father alone. Okay. Also, Jesus, um, in John eleven thirty three, 33, when he saw the women weeping uh, as her brother died, and the Jews had come weeping, he was deeply moved in a spirit and troubled. And he said to them, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. He had to ask them where. And Jesus wept over him. He emptied himself of, of his omnipotence. In Mark chapter 6, verse 5, it says, And he could do no miracle there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. The Son can do nothing by himself. By myself, I can do nothing. That's John chapter 5, verses 19 and 30. So Christ became a man like you and was dependent on the empowering of the Holy Spirit to do miracles, just as we are. He was tempted just as we are. In fact, he said, I have come down from heaven and do uh, heaven and not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. I do nothing on my own. I always do what pleases him. That's John 6, 38 and chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Jesus was completely dependent and led by the Holy Spirit as well. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted by the devil. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. God cannot get tired. He cannot grow weary. In fact, he needs nothing. And yet Jesus hungered, Matthew 21, 18. He thirsted, John chapter 4, verse 7. He became weary and needed sleep, John chapter 4, verse 6, and other verses. He experienced pain and death, which God cannot do. In fact, Jesus experiences every pain that you do, emotional, physical, and spiritual. Oh, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in all things, just as we are yet without sin. Because of that, we can enter boldly to the throne of grace. You know, why am I camping on this and spending so much time on this? Because many theologians and pastors get this wrong. I'm just giving you what the Bible says. Amen? He had to learn obedience, even to become obedient to the point of death, which he didn't want to do. Lord, take this cup from me, yet not my will. So he's telling us what his will is. I don't want to die on the cross, but let your will be done. He was tested and he had trials. He prayed. In fact, we found out last week two of his prayers are still unanswered. Father, make them one, even as you and I are one, speaking of the church, and let your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Won't happen until the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus emptied himself of his sinless nature. You see, you can't be tempted if you don't have a human nature. God can't be tempted. We read the verse. But Christ was tempted in all things, yet without sin. Thank the Lord for that. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. And yet Jesus was equal to God the Father. So back to our text, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. That's the kenosis. What did he empty himself of? Many of his divine attributes, the power, but not his personality. Who he was as still the third member or the second member of the Trinity. He was still fully the Son of God. In John 17, 5, Jesus prayed, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself 
with the glory which I had with you before the world was. That's pretty clear. Jesus was not a man who God deified. Jesus was God the Son from eternity past and was glorified with the Father, equal with the Father in heaven, but emptied himself. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, a prophecy about the Messiah. It says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be ruler of Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Speaking of eternity past, speaking of Jesus Christ. And today... Jesus is at God the Father's right hand, making intercession for us. Isn't that great? You know, when you pray, Jesus knows, I know exactly what you're going through. He knows you. He sympathizes with you. He's not up there, how could you do that again? Oh, no, he knows the flesh that we deal with because he became flesh. He knows the temptations because he was dependent on God and the Holy Spirit, even as we are. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you were caught up to heaven right now, you would see the Father seated on a throne. And you would see Jesus seated next to him at the right hand of God the Father. That's Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God, that's the Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. Again, there's no confusion about the Trinity in the Bible. Here, Jesus, the man Jesus, is the mediator between the Father and us. Why is that? A mediator has to know both parties exactly to be a mediator properly between them. So Christ, being fully God from eternity past, knows the Father intimately. They're one, even as uh, a man and a woman leave their father and mother, cleave uh, to their wife, and the two become one flesh, completely unified. But he emptied himself, became a man. So Paul writes to Timothy, there is one God, the Father, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom. Because Jesus will eternally be a man, yet still God the Son. Co-equal with the Father, but always subordinate to him. Of course, we know during the millennial reign in Daniel chapter 7, God the Father will give Jesus all rule and authority. And for the first time from eternity past, the Father will be submissive to the Son. Isn't that amazing? But at the end of that thousand-year reign, and he conquers his last uh, one at the uh, great white throne judgment, that's death. It says in Corinthians that Jesus will then give all rule and authority back to God the Father for eternity. But for a thousand years, Jesus will be King of kings and Lord of lords. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. You can turn there if you want. We'll read a few scriptures here. It says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. And here's the great part of that. Therefore, because of this, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus knows 
everything that you deal with in this life. He is the perfect mediator, the one mediator between God and man. He is our high priest. We can run to him with all of our trials, with all of our problems, and even with all of our temptations. And he says, come here, son, come here, daughter. I know exactly what you're going through, and I love you, and I paid for that on the cross. I pray that all of us would appropriate the, the beauty and the amazing thing that God, creator of all things, the Son, Jesus Christ, became a man and knows exactly what we face. It is the most radical truth, the most radical thing this world has ever seen. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, come on up, worship team. It says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory, and in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Uh, if you have questions or uh, you have a response and would like to debate uh, some of the things I said today, I'd love to do that. Go to our website. Uh, you'll find my email. And uh, let's engage. Let's, uh, as iron sharpens iron, get into the word. God bless you. All right. This next song is called The Blessing. And uh, the words came out from the uh, book of Moses, uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers. And in the Bible, you